All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to LAN for the introduction. Thank you to SEED for organizing uh, this mini symposium. And uh, um, today I will tell you what we are interested in in my lab. And uh, the ubiquity in proteasome system has been introduced already by Avram, so I will not go through. Just to remind you that uh, of 20,000 uh, genes in the mammalian genome, about 1,000 are dedicated to the ubiquitin proteasome system. Of these, uh, 600 encode ubiquitin ligases. And ubiquitin ligases come in different family. What we study in our lab is the family of Carlin ring ligases. These are multi subunit ubiquitin ligases, and there are more than 200 members of this family. So what are the uh, CRLs? Uh, Carlin, because there is a Carlin subunit in all CRLs, this is a sort of scaffold protein which holds at the uh, C-terminus the ring finger protein. Uh, at, the, uh, at the N-terminus binds an assembly factor which brings the substrate receptor which uh, binds specifically to downstream substrates. The ring finger protein is necessary to bind the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, or E2, which brings the ubiquitin to the substrate. So the family of uh, CRLs is subdivided in five subfamilies, uh, each one containing a different uh, culling scaffold uh, subunit, and each Carlin will bind different assembly factor and uh, substrate receptors. So for instance, Cal1 will bind a family of uh, about 70 F-box proteins in mammals, and, uh, and um, Cal2 will bind uh, VH, VHL-box proteins, uh, uh, Cal3 will bind BTB proteins, uh, Cal4 DCAF proteins, and finally, uh, uh, Cal5 SOX box proteins. And today I will uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, CRL1s that are also known as SCF, as mentioned by Abram, and uh, CRL4s. And again, as mentioned by Abram, UPS controls virtually every cellular function. Uh, its deregulation is involved in many human diseases. And in our lab, we study mostly uh, cancer. So uh, there is a lot of talking about uh, translating basic science, but clearly uh, a problem with translation are often due to uh, bad basic science. So to translate something, it requires a deep understanding of molecular cellular mechanism that has to come before translation. And you have to translate only worthy text. If you don't have a worthy text, translation becomes useless. So this is the importance of basic science, the importance of understanding uh, what the, uh, enzymes, in our case, ubiquitin like this, do in the cell before we can translate anything. And so uh, in our lab, we are interested in uh, molecular mechanism, and their study uh, allows us to answer three major questions. So first of all, what are the CRLs whose aberrant activity contributes to uh, human diseases, such as cancer? How can we exploit this information in therapy, and how can CRLs and other ubiquitin ligases be reprogrammed to target new substrates? So along the years, uh, my laboratory has matched about 40 substrates ubiquitin ligase pairs. And we start in general from proteomics and somatic cell genetic studies to identify the initial hits. And then, of course, we validate them in uh, uh, cell system as well as in uh, animal models. 
So I'll give you some examples of uh, uh, questions. These are recent questions that we have asked, that postdocs in the lab have asked. Uh, KIP-1 is a ubiquity ligase. It's actually a substrate receptor of a CRL3 and uh, is lost in lung cancers. And when it's lost, promotes metastasis. But how? Nobody knew about that. Moreover, when KIP-1 is lost, it promotes a brackness phenotype. So it, it mimics a sort of uh, uh, um, DNA damage repair uh, defect. Uh, and by which mechanism was not known. Um, in another, another postdoc asked which CRLs are downregulated by DNA methylation, suggesting that they might be uh, tumor suppressors, which CRLs provide resistance to PARP inhibitors, and finally, this is a very basic question, which CRL targets D-type cyclins for degradation? So these are questions uh, that different postdocs asked in the lab in the last few years, and this is, <laughs> these cartoons shows the answer to these questions. Uh, each of these little cartoon is several years of work of a poor postdoc uh, in my lab. So, but we don't stop here. Uh, after we understand the molecular mechanism uh, by which some proteins are degraded, then uh, this will give us insights in terms of therapy. And so we'll offer the possibility to understand whether we can exploit this information uh, to, um, to, uh, um, in terms of therapy, and particularly in terms of uh, uh, how this mechanism can induce sensitivity or resistance to different uh, uh, therapeutics. And of course, we test these uh, um, once again in uh, uh, cell cultures as well as in mouse models. Uh, I would like to go a little bit deeper for uh, one of these particular studies, and I will, I will go through uh, how we discovered that DCAF3, also known as AMBRA1, targets D-type cyclings uh, for degradation. So, <clears throat> Um, as you heard from uh, Abram, we are interested in cell cycle control, and uh, I'm sure that everyone here knows that different cyclins uh, will activate different CDKs at different stage of the cell cycle to uh, promote uh, progression through the cell cycle. And the first cyclin to be activated in the cell cycle is cyclin D1, the synthesis of cyclin D1 is stimulated by mitogens, and one cyclin D1 is uh, so synthesized, will bind CDK4, as well as CDK6, particularly CDK6 is mostly expressed in hematopoietic cells, and will form an active kinase, which will trigger cell cycle. Now, <clears throat> there are inhibitors of this kinase, and they are used in, uh, in the clinic, particularly in breast cancer. So, because of the importance of cycling one, many labs along the years have asked whether, uh, um, what, what is the system, what, how cycling uh, uh, D1 as well as its parallel of cycling D2 and D3 are degraded uh, during the cell cycle, uh, by which mechanism, by which ubiquitin legacies. And these are papers that have been published between 98 and uh, 2012. And as you can see, uh, they've been published all in uh, uh, good journals, including Nature, Cell, uh, Cancer Cells. And, and basically what these papers suggest uh, is that cycling one is degraded by uh, one of several CRL1s. Okay? So in fact, the... Um, if you look at the literature, there are as many as eight different FBOX proteins that have been reported to target mostly cycling D1, but also cycling D2 and D3. So there are eight different FBOX proteins, there are eight different CRL1 complexes. The problem came uh, when uh, uh, Keiichi Nakayama, a good uh, friend and colleague of mine in Japan, 
publish this paper. And so what uh, Keishi had shown in this paper that either knockout or knock, knockdown of uh, single F-box proteins or in, uh, in F-box protein in combination of two or three have really no effect on site ND1 degradation. So uh, to be honest, we, <laughs> we knew about that because we could reproduce these uh, results. But before this paper was published, I could not convince anyone in my lab uh, to work on ubiquitin ligase for cyclin D because they, they told me that this was already published. But after Keiichi Nakayama published this paper, I was able to convince uh, Daniele, Daniele Simonetsky, uh, to work on that. And so we started from the beginning. Um, so one of the very first experiments by the way, each of these experiments has been done in multiple cell lines, but you know, for simplicity, I will show you only representative results. So in these cells, uh, we uh, express dominant negative Cal1. We can induce it with uh, doxycycline. And when we induce Cal1, we stabilize these two uh, known substrate of uh, uh, CRL1 ligases, you heard about P27. We also published with Avram that P21, uh, a casein of P27 is also uh, a substrate. But despite the accumulation of these established substrates, we saw no effect on the type cyclins. And this is true also when we enhanced uh, the degradation of cycling one with DNA damage. Um, again, no effect when we stop, when we induce dominant negative Cal1. So in a way, this simple experiment suggesting Cal1 doesn't play any role, SCF, CRL1s don't play any role, increasing doubts about all these studies that I have shown you before. But is uh, cycling the one a target of the proteasome? Yes, you see in different cell lines, you treat cells with uh, MG132, blocking the proteasomal activity, and you accumulate cyclin D1. You can also use this other inhibitor. This is an inhibitor of nedylation. Nedylation uh, is a, a post-translational modification necessary for all CRLs to be active. When you block CRLs, you also accumulate, uh, accumulate cyclin D1, okay? And, uh, and you stabilize, this is the half-life of uh, cycling D1. So we confirmed that it must be one of the 230 CRLs. But before we understand which one, we asked if it's not Cal1, which Calin is involved. So we downregulated by sRNA all Calins individually. We saw no effect with Cal1, no effect with any other Calin. Only when we downregulate Cal4, then we see accumulation of cycling D1, as well as the phosphorylated form of cycling D1. It, it, it is known that cycling D1 is phosphorylated on threonine 286. When it's phosphorylated, it's unstable. This is a typical, uh, um, this amino acid is typically mutated in cancer to stabilize cycling D1 and to have more cycling D1 to promote cell growth. So we thought, okay, if it's not Cal1, it must be a Cal4 dependent ligase. Now Cal4 has um, a, another uh, common subunit, DDB1. This is a sort of assembly factor. If you downregulate DDB1, you also stabilize cycling D1, cycling D3, and you will accumulate the phosphorylated form of cycling D1. The conclusion of this experiment is we don't believe that CRL1 has anything to do. It must be CRL4. So we need to understand which decaf among uh, uh, the various decaf proteins present in mammalian cells is doing the job. And so here we decided to use three approaches. One approach was very simple. We downregulate by sRNA all the decaf proteins in the cell. But we also wanted to go further and see whether we, ha we got same results with two other completely unbiased approaches. So let me tell you very quickly, 
uh, about the two, about the three approaches. The first one, we expressed fluorescent cycling D1 at low levels, and then we treated cells with the an SRNA library, SRNA that target all the decaf proteins uh, in two different cell lines. We see accumulation with few of them. One that was very robust was AMBRA1, decaf3, where we saw accumulation with, that stayed with time in contrast to, let's say, ERK8, that first accumulated, then tend to go down again. Then we purified cycling D1, either wild type or the mutant that is not supposed to bind the ubiquitin ligase, and we did in presence of MG132 or MLN4924, which we know that by blocking the uh, ubiquitination or degradation, uh, stabilized the complex between the ubiquitin ligase and the substrate. And so when we IP'd cycling D1 wild type, we saw a number of uh, ubiquitin ligases, but the one that behaved the best, as expected in a way, was AMBRA1. AMBRA1 only comes down with the wild type, not with the mutant, and the binding increases in presence of proteasome and CRL inhibitors. Third approach was a, another unbiased approach in which uh, when we express uh, cycling D1 fluorescent, then we uh, treated these cells with a CRISPR uh, library and we saw uh, two uh, candidates. So from these three approaches, there was a common one, uh, AMBRA1, which seemed to also to behave in a way that suggested that AMBRA1 was the right one, and we validated, we validated in every possible way. Uh, this is a simple experiment of sRNA. Uh, we downregulated a bunch of uh, ubiquitin ligases that have been proposed or they came out from our screens. Only AMBRA will induce accumulation cycling like one. Um, this is light, just to tell you that in different cell lines we can knock out cycling D1, uh, sorry, AMBRA1, uh, and compared to parental cells, we see a huge accumulation of uh, uh, cycling D1, D3, and phosphorylated form of cycling D1. And then uh, we used a acute uh, downregulation of AMBRA. I think this is really the golden a standard to understand if a substrate is, uh, is degraded by a particular ubiquitin ligase. And, and what we did was to um, fuse the endogenous uh, AMBRA uh, with uh, a minimal uh, auxin degron. Auxin uh, um, is a plant hormone that induced degradation of uh, uh, downstream targets working as a molecular glue that was discovered by Nick Zhang. And uh, uh, this system is used to uh, downregulate proteins in mammalian cells by treating the cells with auxin. So once you treat uh, uh, mammalian cells that have been so uh, modified, you see degradation of endogenous AMBRA within 30 minutes. And once AMBRA is downregulated, cycling D1 immediately starts to accumulate. You can wash out auxin, and now AMBRA will accumulate again, and uh, cycling D1 levels will decrease again. And this is just to show you that the effect of uh, auxin is very similar to the effect of MG and MLN. So there is no additional uh, increase when you treat cells with auxin plus proteasome inhibitors or CRL inhibitors, suggesting that um, AMBRA is the only, or at least the very major ubiquitin ligase for uh, the type cyclins. Without AMBRA, you lose the ubiquitination of uh, uh, cycling D1, and of course, by uh, adding a flag in addition to the uh, MID on the endogenous locus, allowed us to purified AMBRA, and together we co-purify cycling D1. So this is all endogenous. So the conclusion of these experiments is that uh, CRL4 AMBRA1 
target site in the one for degradation. Uh, this was done in, in uh, cells. We did it also in, in animals. These animals die in uterus, but they die with high levels of cyclin D1 compared to uh, wild-type animals. Then what about cancer? Cyclin D1 is an oncoprotein, so AMBRA1 is, a, uh, is supposed to be a tumor suppressor. In fact, we see many mutations and deletions and a lot of uh, uh, downregulation by promoter uh, hypermethylation. So when you lose AMBRA, you will accumulate cyclin D1 and promote uh, uh, oncogenic events. Uh, I don't have time to show you all the number of experiments that, that we have done, uh, some of which in collaboration with Luca Busino, um, that is here in the audience, an ex postdoc in the lab who is now uh, an associate professor at UPenn. Um, I just would like to show you this single experiment. So in, this is a mouse model of lymphomogenesis and uh, uh, animals are treated with CDK4-6 inhibitors. And so uh, we use two different uh, uh, doses, low and high, and there is not much difference among the two. Um, in both cases, the animals survive longer. This is in wild, using wild-type cells. However, if we inject in mice uh, AMBRA knockout cells, now we see a completely different story. Uh, we see that the low dose here has no effect, like really like vehicle, and then the high dose, yes, will increase survival, but not as well as in the, when you use wild type, uh, AMBRA wild type cells. So the absence of AMBRA reduces sensitivity to CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. So in conclusion, you know, we found that CRL4 um, uh, AMBRA uh, controls cell cycle progression by inducing the degradation of cycling D1, and deregulation of this event will induce uh, embryonic lethality, oncogenesis, and resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors. So in the course of this uh, uh, work, uh, we had a, a, a an observation, uh, we, look, we saw that cycling one is present in the nucleus of some cells, and these cells happen to be EDU negative. So either cells incorporate EDU, either they replicate their DNA, or they express cycling one, but never both. So cycling one is eliminated prior to DNA synthesis in uh, parental cells, if you remove AMBRA, now will be present in all cells, okay? Uh, and the question is, why mammalian cells need to eliminate cyclin D1 before uh, S phase? Uh, and this is an important question because cyclin D1 has been known for uh, 30 years to bind PCNA, an, an important cofactor in uh, DNA replication as well as in DNA repair. And uh, to make a long story short, I will only show this cartoon. These are unpublished results. But basically, what we know is that uh, in S phase, you require mismatch repair. This is because DNA replication has many mis makes, makes many mistakes, and so mismatch repairs will repair them. If you have cycling D1 during S phase, as we saw in AMBRA knockout cells, but also in many cancer cells, uh, cycling the one through a mechanism that if you are interested, I will tell you later, is inhibiting mismatch repair. Therefore, you will have deficient DNA repair and genome instability. This effect is totally CDK4 independent. So cycling the one doesn't need to bind uh, CDK4 to block the activity of uh, mismatch repair factors. In fact, it needs to bind P21. And, and this suggests that uh, perhaps uh, cycling D1 degraders could be more effective than CDK4-6 inhibitors because with these guys, you only block the activity uh, and therefore you, the effect of cycling D1 on the cycle progression. While with a degrader, you will remove the activity, but you will also remove the 
effect of cycling the one on genome instability. So in the last few minutes, let me talk you to introduce actually uh, Protax and uh, molecular glues. About 70% of disease targets are undragable via classical approaches. And so people are uh, thinking about targeted protein degradation. And in particular, they want to use Protax and molecular glues. As you can see from the font sites, I'm biased towards molecular glues. But let me tell you what is a product, uh, although I'm sure that almost everyone in this room knows. Uh, products are proteolysis targeted uh, chimeras, and they uh, are supposed to target undragable proteins. And what they do, they are bringing together an ubiquitin ligase with a substrate that normally in the cell doesn't bind that particular ubiquitin ligase. And it does it through a product which is formed by two warheads, one binding the ubiquitin ligase, one the substrate with a linker in between. And so uh, products work with a uh, non-stoichiometric catalytic mechanism of action, which should uh, allow to uh, get rid of the substrate by using doses that are uh, um, uh, lower than the doses that you will use just by inhibiting, binding and inhibiting the neo substrate. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can target theoretically any ligandable proteins. So you have a compound that binds a pocket of the substrate. You can form a product. And uh, in general, we believe that these are very effective on proteins with limited resynthesis rate. Um, we are concerned, and there is some evidence that if there is too much synthesis, you might overwhelm the ubiquitin. Uh, uh, ligase, and therefore you don't get enough degradation. Now, what ab about molecular glues? Molecular glues, in contrast to products, involve a non-chimeric small molecule, so this is much smaller than a product, and uh, like products, they will allow uh, new interaction between uh, a novel substrate and the UBL. They also have a catalytic non-stoichiometric uh, MOA, but uh, it has some advantage because it's a small chimeric, non-chimeric uh, protein. It's, it's, it's also small enough to be a drug-like compound, and therefore, uh, you know, might not have the disadvantage of the product to, uh, to be large and therefore uh, uh, limit cell availability, increase uh, uh, cell toxicity. Uh, uh, toxicity in the, uh, in the patient, I apologize. Um, the other interesting part is an, uh, the studies from uh, Ningsa Zen Club, and I believe you will present some of these, shows that you don't need high affinity on both sides. Here you do. Here you need affinity only on one side. And uh, in general, the substrate, but it could be the opposite, the substrate uh, uh, doesn't have a pocket that is ligandable. The, uh, uh, the binding occurs when the, sub, the small molecule binds the E3 with high affinity, and then it forms a, a new surface which is recognized by uh, the downstream substrate. So uh, in contrast to product which can target untargetable uh, proteins, uh, molecular glues have the advantage also to target unligandable proteins. And finally, most products work with uh, uh, one of two UBLs. In the case of molecular glues, many ubiquitin ligases uh, can be used, allowing a substrate-centric approach rather than uh, a ubiquitin ligase-centric uh, uh, one. Now, the great advantage of products is that allows rational designs, while molecular glues, um, you know, not many people know how to make them. And in fact, the identification of molecular glues is a very challenging question in the field. And I use this word de novo because there are indeed molecular glues in nature. 
I mentioned plant hormones that were studied by uh, Ning. These are nothing else than uh, molecular glues bringing substrate to uh, CRL1, like uh, ubiquitin ligases. And there are uh, drugs that, has been, that have been used for decades uh, in the field, and people didn't know that they were molecular glues, and only more recent studies had shown their mechanism of action. So, you know, imids, sulfanamides are molecular glues that target new substrates to uh, CRL4s. So, to summarize, uh, what we study in, in the lab are the fundamental molecular and cellular mechanisms regulated by CRLs. We use many different approaches to study uh, these enzymes, and we do study these enzymes because we are curious, but also because we think that molecular mechanisms explain disease mechanisms and inform about vulnerabilities and how to target them. And so I stop here, and these are people in the lab, some of the recent uh, alumni in academia, Luca, which you will meet uh, this afternoon, and some of our collaborators. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.